Um, last week we began a study on the first missionary journey of Paul. We actually talked about mostly things that took place right before his missionary journey. Um, in particular, we talked about in uh, Acts chapter 11, uh, the church at Antioch and its role in the missionary journeys of Paul. And as we noted last week, all three of the missionary journeys that Paul goes on all originate from the city of Antioch. And, you know, it, it's very important, and I, and I think that's the reason why we follow the pattern today, that uh, any missionary uh, most typically has a a sponsoring congregation, and in fact, the way it usually works in, in the world is most of the time they have a sponsoring congregation here in the United States. There are some in other parts of the world that do have, that do sponsor mission works in their country or whatever, but primarily, you know, it, uh, the ones that we're associated with or, or know of, generally you'll have a sponsoring congregation that, that receives the money or whatever for the support or maybe they support them entirely themselves, and then they send out the missionary to their work wherever they are around the globe. And um, it's pretty apparent that Antioch was that for the Apostle Paul. And you know, they, they each time would pray over him, and they each time would send him out, and send him out with provisions, and were very much his support. Um, we talked about how Antioch was such an, uh, an amazing and wonderful congregation. It's the one, one of the ones that began because they ran away from Saul when he was persecuting the church. And how that Barnabas was sent there because they were doing such a good job and they were beginning to preach to some of the Gentiles. The apostles sent Barnabas and Barnabas went there a while and everything grew rapidly and Barnabas decided he needed help. And so he goes and he gets Saul. And Saul works there with Barnabas. And they find out about a famine that is going to be in Jerusalem, Judea. And so they, they gather up funds and they send Paul and Barnabas down to Jerusalem to take those funds. And they do that. And uh, they're able to, to go down there and do that. And then they come back. And then it was a little while after they come back that we come to chapter 13, in which uh, the last verse of chapter 12 says, And Barnabas saw re return from Jerusalem when they completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. And that, that John Mark, uh, his mother, as we see uh, earlier on, was uh, in, in this chapter, was Mary, the woman that. Peter goes to, the, the house that Peter goes to when he gets out of prison earlier in the, the chapter. Um, Mary is, uh, like I say, John Mark's mother. Um, there's at least a little bit of speculation. I think there's a little something to this that somehow or another John Mark could have been related to Peter. Some have even supposed his son. I don't think that's a crazy idea. Um, there's nothing really that that specifically supports that. But, you know, you get out of prison in the middle of the night, where do you head? I think heading home is a likely place. And going to Mary's house could, could have actually been uh, Peter's wife and, and therefore John Mark, his son. And like I said, that's purely speculative. But at any rate, that was a place that was important enough to Peter. It's the first place he went to in the middle of the night when he got out of prison. And the, the church was gathered there praying for Peter. And therefore also, you know, if you were going to gather somewhere to pray, you know, the, the spouse of the person there would be a likely place you'd do that. But anyway, John Mark does seem to be connected with Peter in some way. And, uh, you know, with Peter's persecution, it might be a good idea to get Peter's son out of town. Possibly also. But anyway, John Mark comes back and John Mark, as we find out, is a cousin of Barnabas's. He's stated that uh, in, in 2 Timothy. But we find out he is a cousin of Barnabas. But he comes with them, and Barnabas and Paul take uh, John Mark on this missionary journey with them. 
And so, he is also the one that uh, the book of Mark is attributed to. And so, um, he is a, is a, a significant individual in, in what's going to unfold in, in the early church. I have the handout, and of course this on the back is, is the same as the handout. I want to note a couple things on there. Um, this is kind of where the missionary journey goes. Um, it begins, of course, in Antioch, like we said. Antioch, and then they go to the island of Cyprus, and go from one end of it to the other, and then go up to Perga. And then they go to Antioch of Pisidia. It's the other Antioch. Um, Antioch of Syria is the one that is his main place that he goes to, but Antioch of, of Syria, Pisidia is, is the other one. Then he goes on to Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, and then they turn around and go back and come back down, uh, down around and sail back to Antioch. This, uh, when they're done in Antioch, when we'll see in a little while, uh, at the end of chapter 14, there are some that come up from Judea, which down here is where Jerusalem is in that area, that are preaching that the, the Gentiles need to become circumcised in order to be a part of the church. And Paul and Barnabas aren't going to have any part of that, and they're going to go check that out. So they, along with some others, go down to Jerusalem to work that out. And so that's where the Antioch down to Jerusalem is, and where we have the meeting that you see in Acts chapter 15 that's there, that's, that's that last little leg of it. The uh, people that made this map included that part also in this as they go down to Jerusalem, although I wouldn't technically call that a part of the, the first missionary journey, but, but they do go down to uh, Jerusalem shortly right after that. So when you look at that, you'll notice if you look at maps of the other missionary journeys, they all spread out wider. So the first one is the shortest. It's roughly half the distance of the second and third missionary journeys. And uh, so um, you, might, you might in some ways view this a little bit as, as uh, Paul's training missionary journey because it's after this first missionary journey that Paul and Barnabas split. When they begin the second missionary journey is when they have their split. Barnabas will go with... John Mark, and Paul will take Silas, and shortly after uh, Paul, Paul, and of course I don't want to get ahead of myself, but when we go to the second missionary journey, um, Barnabas goes basically the route, begins the route of the first missionary journey, and Paul will go on this way and go straight over to Derby and Lystra. He'll, he'll go around by land or, or cut across, we don't know, but he'll, he'll end up over here first. And it's there in uh, Lystra that he gets Timothy on the second, at the beginning of the second missionary journey. And so that's where he comes in. All right. To the text. Um, I'll leave that up there if you want to look at it. If you get bored with what I'm saying and you want to daydream about something that's beneficial, you can look at that. Um, we get to chapter 13, start in verse 1. Let's look at the text here. It says, Now there was a church in Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manane, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them and sent them off. So they were, they were back to uh, Antioch and there were many of them gathered together and they were, they were uh, worshiping, they're praying, they're fasting. And in the middle of that, um, you know, they, have, they have these prophets gathered together and the, the Holy Spirit speaks to them and says, I want, you to, I want to send Barnabas and Saul out. Something back about Antioch. Antioch is the first, you might say, church that Barnabas worked with. The apostles sent him, sent him there. And Barnabas, you might say, really, he, he thrived there. And to show, I believe, his humility, 
to show his, his attitude, his, his, his um, desire to overall build up uh, the kingdom. And, you know, great leaders aren't afraid to attract other great leaders. And Barnabas specifically leaves Antioch to go find Saul. You know, he had met Saul earlier when he introduced him to the apostles. And I, I would imagine Barnabas knew because of what had happened with, with Saul that Saul was going to be somebody likely who would outshine, outlead him. It takes a very comfortable person to go pick somebody better, than, better and brighter than themselves to join the team. You know what I mean? Leaders that that feel uncomfortable with somebody around as smart as they are, as talented as they are, tend to keep people that aren't so talented around. It destroys businesses. It destroys teams. It destroys or any kind of organization. But it takes a very humble and strong leader to go pick and try to, to draw people in that are also very strong leaders. And it says a lot about that Barnabas being the son of encouragement was aptly named in order to, to recognize that Saul was worth going and getting. I think you might say the same thing about Barnabas' insistence on John Mark. Because after all, John Mark does write one of the four gospel accounts that we find later. Barnabas sees something in John Mark that even the Apostle Paul doesn't see. And I think that's significant. Barnabas is a, is a very, um, very important figure in, in all of this. And, and it was Barnabas that went and got Paul. And Barnabas is, is certainly uh, going off with Saul in this... Uh, in this missionary journey. So they send them off. It says in verse 4, and so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. From there, they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the Word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a, fa a Jew... Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus. He was with the proconsul, uh, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Okay, they get on to Salamis and they go across to Paphos, and you see them on the map that you have if you've got one of the handouts or on the screen. And they went all across the island. We know because when Paul was converted, when Paul was converted in Acts chapter 9, do you remember what God's stated purpose for Saul was going to be? Well, his main purpose was going to go to the Gentiles. His main focus was going to be go to the Gentiles to preach to the Gentiles. What you will notice... What do they do when they get to the island of Cyprus? Where do they go? Where's that? They go to the synagogues. How many Jews would be in the, I mean Gentiles would be in the synagogues? None. You will notice all through Paul's missionary journeys that he will often, when he goes to a new city, goes to the synagogues first and goes to the Jews. First, um, even though he is going to be the apostle to the Gentiles, he makes every effort to go to his Jewish brethren also. In particular, he typically goes there first. Any idea why he might do such a thing? Okay. Okay, uh, out of respect, I think there's an element to that, Rodney, that there's a respect for his Jewish brethren. You know, he is a Jew after all. Jesus was a Jew. All the apostles are, are Jews. Uh, so certainly there's a, a respect level. 
Okay? He's preaching to them about why he's going to the Gentiles. All right? Right. Yeah, they, they already knew what it meant to serve and worship one God. And, and that was the same God that, that Paul was proclaiming. And so they already had a frame of reference. And so if their hearts were open, they would naturally be easier to convert possibly than the Gentiles. It gave them a place to start. And I think there's... A, there's there's some significance there. That, that when we think about trying to reach the lost, what is important is for us to find a place to start and find maybe the best place to start. And Paul recognized that a given synagogue in each and all of the cities was the most logical choice to start. And certainly he reached out to the Gentiles, but he started off with them. He... He goes to each of the synagogues and proclaims the truth. He goes to the end of the island, come all the way to the end of the island at Paphos, and then there is, when he gets there, there's a, there's a magician, a, a charlatan, if you will, uh, whose name is Bar-Jesus, which means son of Jesus. Uh, Jesus was a relatively common name in that day and time, and so, uh, I don't think anything connected in any way, shape, or form with the Jesus that we're all very familiar with. But uh, his father happened to also be named that as well. But he's a false prophet. Um, he is Jewish, but he's a false prophet. And so he wants everybody to think that he's the real deal and, and that people should follow him. Much like the, the, uh, the magician sorcerer that we saw in, in Acts chapter 8 that, um, that Philip ran into that uh, was trying to, uh, to, to trick the people there. And so um, here is this guy that's trying to draw everybody away, trying to, uh, to trick them and trap them. And, and he runs into Paul. <laughs> and... Uh, when you run into the real deal, you, you don't get very far. Well, this false prophet apparently has the proconsul, which would have essentially been the, uh, the leader for that town, the, the, the mayor, if you will. But uh, the proconsul would have been a, would have been a Roman um, appointee. Sergius Paulus, he's a, a man of intelligence, intelligence. He's a smart man. And he hears about Barnabas and Saul and he wants to hear about them. And uh, Elamus the magician, um, that's what his other name was, as well as Bar-Jesus, um, he opposed them. And he sought to turn the proconsul away from faith in verse 9. But Saul, who had also called Paul, and here it is, this is the transition verse. Saul, who was also called Paul, Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. I keep going back and forth when I say Saul and Paul. Now I can just simply call him Paul. <laughs> From the rest of the time on, he is called Paul all the way rest through the Bible. But before this time, he's called Saul. But there, it's just it's a, a quirky little transition verse. Saul, who is also called Paul, said, and from then on, he's, he's Paul all the way rest of the way through. Um, I, you know, I don't know why that is. The names have uh, similar meanings. They're, they're alternatives of that. But, um, you know, the, the biggest thing is, is that the, the name Paul, you know, indicates the new change that was made in him and the fact that God was with him and he was, was uh, going to be the proclaimer of the truth instead of who he had been before. And so... He looks at him and says, you're a son of the devil and an enemy of all righteousness. And says, to shorten it there, you're going to be blinded. And he was. And everybody was amazed at what, uh, what happened. Um, 
I think of this text when here's this man that opposed Paul and Paul struck him blind. I think of that's the text I think of when we just got done reading 2 Corinthians. We saw those last couple chapters where Paul says, You will determine how I come to you. You know, I'll come to you with power, um, you know, or I'll come to you in love. It's kind of your choice. And I think of this, this guy here who opposed Paul and thinking about the danger and the, uh, the peril of being on the wrong side of, of the Apostle Paul. And I think of this guy that was on the wrong side of him. Any questions or comments? Good. Okay. Um, they leave the uh, they leave the island of Cyprus, and in chapter thirteen and verse thirteen and following, they go to Perga, and then Pamphylia. Pamphylia uh, in in Pamphylia, that that's that that region that is there. Um, you know, we are. Um, in the outer and in, in part of Asia, this this area through here would end up being uh, part of what is modern day Turkey. Yes. I have a, a question or a comment on verse twelve back there. Uh huh. It says that the the, the leader here, the pro council, was astonished. He was astonished at the miracle, but what caused him to believe was the word. Mm hmm. The word itself. The false thought. It wasn't the right. Word, the miracle. The miracle caught his attention, and it was the word. Yeah, it was. He was astonished at the teaching of the Lord, you know, about what the Lord had said and done, and 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 the message from him, and that that's very true. And that really, uh, Randy, uh, is a very good point in that when you look all through the New Testament, the miracles were not the teaching. There, now there were things that were taught through the miracles. But the miracle was not the teaching itself. The miracle was to draw attention to the teaching that would follow. That's what the purpose for them was. And so this, this is a, a great example, another example of that, that um, they performed the miracle and then um, everybody wanted to hear what they had to say. Whereas now, we, we don't need the miracle because we have the teaching. And, you know, they, however, didn't have the Bible. You know, there, there was really not any text that they could give to them other than the Old Testament at this point. Um, when Paul began this missionary journey, there wasn't likely anything that they could cite as far as New Testament Scripture. Yes, sir? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, very, very true. Yeah, and that and that's that's how those things went together, is that someone that could perform those kind of miracles would clearly have the backing of God, have the the uh, the truth that God brings. You remember uh, in John chapter three, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, and when Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. He says, we know you're a prophet from God because no one can perform the miracles that you perform unless God is with him. And so they knew, you know, he knew. He acknowledged it. The other people, you know, maybe didn't realize it, but, but Nicodemus said, you know, I don't know who all he was speaking on behalf of, but he said, we know that you're a prophet from God or you couldn't do what you're doing. And so that's very true for the apostles for Christ and for others. How do we know that we're from God? Well, we've got God's Word to, to match up what we say and do. Yeah, they teach that, but they're ignoring a whole lot of truth. You know, um, well, like last Sunday morning, um, you know, I, I described the passage in in uh, Revelation 7 of all the people that were assembled around the throne of God. And here are the, the, the clearly the righteous saved of all of 
human history. And they are the ones that are around the throne of God. And, and what qualified them to be there? That they were washed in the blood of the Lamb. And if you can give me a logical reason in Scripture that, that gives a description of being washed in the blood of the Lamb that does not involve baptism, I want to hear about it. Because everything is tied with that. We do not. We do not. Um, and so... Um, he says he believed when he saw what occurred. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he was saved. It doesn't mean that uh, you know, he, he acted upon it. Uh, belief doesn't always precipitate obedience. Yeah, the, demon, the demons believe, as James tells us. Yeah, the demons believe, but yet you know, we... We need to recognize that uh, there's more to that, much more to that than, than just simply belief. And there's several things in the book of Acts that, that point out that those that you know, are converted, all of them are baptized, all of them go through that. Um, and you've got many things that Paul wrote himself, Romans 6 and, and you know passage we looked at in Colossians the other day about being... Uh, things being nailed to the cross and that we're uh, connected with Christ through the, through the blood of the cross. So anyway, but you're right. A lot of people want to, want to just simply say that, that belief is, is that. And, and belief is necessary for salvation, but it's not, it's not the be-all, end-all in salvation. Okay. Um, they go to Antioch of Pisidia, and um, while they're there, the Apostle Paul uh, preaches, and he gives um, a rather lengthy sermon as far as Scripture goes. Starts in verse 16 and goes all the way to um, verse 41. And, you know, they. they uh, he goes all that way, you know, and, and preached quite, quite a, a length. Because he's in a synagogue, he primarily talks about, about David, King David. And the reason being is because King David, he is the one that's prophesied to have one who sits on the throne forever. And David wrote a, the, the majority of the Psalms. And so basically... Uh, Paul is bringing things out of the Psalms and quotes the Psalms in uh, some of his texts there. And so he quotes the Psalms and quotes the prophets in uh, the latter part of his lesson. And in so doing, is proving to them that Jesus is the one that King David was prophesying about. He's the one that is the son that God had begotten. He's the one that all the world's going to be blessed through. And, and all of that will come about in regard to Jesus. And so, it doesn't seem like there are many that, you know, when you get to verse 43, you know, they, they want to hear more about it. It doesn't seem like there's many that immediately want to believe, but they're intrigued. And they come back the next Sabbath day, in verse 44, and almost the whole city gathered because they heard about the week before. There are a lot of people that seemed interested. There are a lot of people that were, were wondering about what he's saying. And so they bring almost the whole city. And, well, the Jewish leaders in the crowd try to stir up trouble, try to cause problems, and yet they do convert many. Paul, in his sermon this next time, proclaims that the Gentiles can be a part of God's kingdom, that Gentiles will have salvation. The Gentiles rejoice at that in verse 48. They're excited about it. And the, the, uh, the message is, is spread, but trouble 
starts trying to divide the Jews and cite the devout uh, women of high standing and leading men of the city. They stir them up. They begin to persecute Paul and Barnabas and drive them out of the district. And it says in verse 51 that they shook the dust off their feet and they went off to Iconium. But the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So they, they excite the town and they convert, they convert some. They convert some Gentiles. And the result is, is that uh, they, they encounter persecution. And that's really going to be a paradigm for what happens throughout all of their, uh, their missionary journey here. And Paul's missionary journeys later, they come into town and people are intrigued for a little while, and then once things get stirred up, and the Jews say, whoa, wait a second, you're going to convert everybody. Or, in the case of, like say when he later gone goes to uh, Ephesus, and in, in later missionary journeys, the, the Gentiles are upset because they're going to stop worshiping idols. And so, he stirs up the people, and whether it be the Jews or the Gentiles, most of the time it's the Jews but stirs them up and they try to persecute them and run them out of town. And that is a recurring pattern that's going to, to come up. They go to Iconium and then they, they after that, um, go on to Lystra. And, uh, you know, this is just one of the most intriguing things you'll find in the, in the, uh, the Gospel, I mean the, uh, the New Testament and missionary journeys. They heal a man in, in, uh, in Acts 14 who was crippled. He's, he's lame and he'd never walked in his entire life. And Paul, he was hearing Paul preaching and he's, he's, he's interested, he's intent and seems to indicate that he believes what Paul's saying. And Paul just simply says, stand up on your feet. And here's a man who's never walked even if they could surgically repair legs like that, it'd take months and months to build up the strength and rehab and everything for someone to maybe be able to walk. But Paul said, get up. And he gets up. And what happens? The whole town's amazed because they knew this man. What happens after that? Lystra is a city that really worships idols a lot. They have a temple to Zeus there. And the, the, uh, the governor, or the, the leader of the, the temple to Zeus, says, you know, basically says, wow, you know, th this, this is amazing. And he calls, they, the people call Barnabas Zeus. They believe Zeus has visited them. And they call Paul Hermes. And so, Zeus and Hermes are two of the main uh, Greek gods. Why do you suppose they call them Zeus and Hermes? Well, Zeus was the main god of the Greeks. Okay? And what they probably surmised from the relationship is that Barnabas was the older, wiser one. And they called him Zeus. And Hermes in Greek mythology, that's the FTD guy, by the way. You know, you look at the, the, the uh, FTD, it's the, the Greek god with the winged feet. The winged feet because Hermes was the messenger god of the Greeks. In other words, the talker. They, they, they gave Barnabas the older, wiser god label. And they gave, they gave Saul, Paul the, uh, the talker god moniker. Well, you can imagine how that would be. That they're, you know... Generally, in a lot of these cities, you know, Paul or Barnabas, they'll perform a miracle, and the whole town is amazed that God is there. Well, now they're in a 
they're in an area that is very deeply Gentile. And they're in an area that's steeped in the Gentile, the, the Greek uh, mythology. And they perform that same miracle and they don't believe it's the Holy Spirit or, or Jehovah God that's doing it. They believe it's Zeus that's doing it. And so the head of the, the Zeus temple to Zeus, what does he do? The priest of Zeus in verse 13 um, and it tells in verse 12 that, that Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And so the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. You get what they're getting ready to do? They're getting ready to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. Because they believe Zeus and Hermes are in town. Um, that's some unintended consequences for the miracle. But what is, what is Paul and Barnabas' reaction? Oh, you know, they, they tear their clothes and they, they, they're upset. They rush in the crowd and say, Why are you doing these things? We're men just like you. And we bring you good news. And proclaim... <laughs> The, the truth to them and, and want to do want them to know that. And they even it says that even even with all the things they said uh, in verse 18, they barely escaped without them offering sacrifices to them. You come to chapter the, to the end of the chapter 19 through uh, 28, what you find is is that, that Paul is preaching in Lystra, and uh, verse 19, uh, But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds. You notice what's happened? Jews have come from Antioch, Antioch and Pisidia, and Iconium, the two previous towns they went to, and they come to Lystra. They have followed them, tracking them down. You know, the Jews in, in Antioch head off where Paul went, and they find more Jews in that town, say, where did he go? Well, we're mad at him too. And they, they what we would call in, in the West, in the Wild West, we call that a, a posse. A posse has come off to get Paul. And what do they do? They incite the people that are there in Lystra. And they persuade the crowds. And they stone Paul. They dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. When the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day went on with Barnabas to Derbe. He was so, they stoned him, and he was so far gone they thought he was dead. Um, I think it's a possibility, we don't know, but in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, when Paul describes being caught up into the third heaven and seeing things that he doesn't know about, it's at least a possibility that this could have been the time when that was. Um, if he was left nearly dead, you know, when he describes that in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. And that almost sounds like a situation where you're kind of between life and death. And that could be, and like I say, that's just speculation, but this could be that moment in which that would have been, the time frame would maybe be about right because he said it was 14 years earlier, and, and somewhere along that time would be about right. So possibility as to when that was. And of course it was in that time that he received the thorn in the flesh. But at any rate, Paul was stoned, left for dead. The disciples come along and he, just almost like in, movie, in pure movie faction, he begins to move a little bit, gets up, and goes back to preaching. That, that's, uh, that's almost like a... You know, that's, that's a real life hero, you know, there that he's stoned and left for dead and they think he's dead and he gets back up and keeps going. After this, they go and they backtrack their, uh, their trail to, uh, and down to Italia, which is next to Perga, and then they sail back to Antioch. And so that's the end of the missionary journey. One thing you'll notice 
Um, I didn't cover it, but John Mark left them when they get to Pamphylia, when they get ready to go uh, ashore into what is Asia or Turkey uh, specifically. When they go to get there, um, he leaves them, and that's upsetting to Paul, upsetting probably to both of them. And that's going to play uh, prominently into the beginning of the second missionary journey, which we'll begin talking about next week. Any questions or comments? Okay, we got it covered. Thank you.